As the baby boom generation begins to reach retirement age, California's senior population will begin to see significant growth. By 2030, the over 65 population will grow by 4 million people and will become a more racially and ethnically diverse population with many living alone. And that has significant implications for the types of senior support services that will be needed in the future. Recently, the nonpartisan Public Policy Institute of California issued a report planning for California's growing senior population that discussed those implications including the need for more nursing care and assisted living facilities, as well as the need for more health care professionals, especially those who provide home and community-based services for seniors. We'll hear from one of the lead authors of the report, Laurel Beck, policy analyst with the Public Policy Institute of California. The Senior Boom, preparing for the baby boom aftershock. Additional funding for the Maddie Report made possible by a grant from The Wonderful Company, harvesting health and happiness around the world, and by Kaiser Permanente. Thrive, from the California Channel at the State Capitol and the Maddie Institute, it's the Maddie Report with Executive Director of the Maddie Institute, Mark Kepler. The Nonpartisan Public Policy Institute of California recently issued a report entitled Planning for California's Growing Senior Population. Our guest, Laurel Beck, is one of the authors of that report. Laurel is an expert in health policy and the policy challenges relating to aging populations and just happens to be an alum of my alma mater, the University of Wisconsin, so welcome. Thank you. Um, how much has uh, California's senior population, how much is it going to grow in the next 10 or 15 years? Uh, so our report is based on Department of Finance projections, and we show an increase of 87% by the year 2030. And we focus on that year because that's when the last segment of the baby boomers will reach retirement age. And to put that in perspective, um, in 2012, there were 4.6 million Californians that were okay. over age 65. And by that number, it will be, or by that year, excuse me, it will be 8.6 million. Yeah, it's 87%, or in other words, it almost doubles. It almost doubles, yeah, 4 million more seniors. Wow. Um, all kinds of opportunities and, and uh, situations to think about. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's take a little closer look at, at the elderly um, and how the senior population is changing in California. How is it changing ethnically? Uh, the change in the racial ethnic composition is going to be significant. Uh, the numbers of seniors in each racial ethnic group is going to grow, but some race ethnic groups are going to grow faster than others. In particular, we're going to see the fastest rates of growth among the Latino and the Asian Pacific Islander populations. So one example is that in 2012, an estimated 18% of seniors in California were Latino. And in 2030, that share is projected to grow up to 26%. No, quite a substantial yes. increase. Um, so what about males and females? They say that... that uh, females live longer than, than males. Are we going to see a, a large female population? Actually, we're, we think that it's going to go in the other direction. Really? We're expecting to see a slight uptick in the number of males as a proportion of the population, and that's kind of because of some gains we've made in life expectancy on certain health conditions. It's, there's a lot of reasons for it. But based on our number, our, excuse me, Department of Finance numbers, uh, we think that the share of males in the population is going to go from about 44% in 2012 to about 45.5%. And that sounds small, um, yeah. but it's actually pretty significant in terms of um, in these kind of demographic Yeah, it's, it's kind of surprising, actually. So let's talk about uh, family structures. Uh, this idea of single and divorced versus uh, married. Or on the other hand, having children versus not having children. How many California's uh, seniors are going to change in that regard? How is it going to change? Uh, it's going to change a lot, we think, actually. Um, based on survey data, we uh, looked at previous trends. And we, when you think about it, in the 1970s and 1980s, we saw shifts away from sort of traditional mom, dad, and two kids family structure. Uh, people were less likely to get married starting around that time. They were less likely to have kids. And those people are now reaching senior age. So we're anticipating seeing seniors that are more likely to have never been married, they're more likely to be divorced, and they're more likely not to have children. But if they, but if they're never been married, they could be with someone and just not married. That's true, and that's that's absolutely true. That we could um, we may not be picking up on specifics um, like if you're cohabiting versus being. Um, Which know, happened like, a lot in the '70s and '80s. And yeah, so, absolutely. So so, so we may be overstating that, but in terms of the number of people in surveys who report that they've never been married, there's going to be a pretty significant uptick. Um, and we think that the number of people who have never had any children is actually going to go up significantly. So one s statistic we cite in the paper is that in 2012, 12% of 75-year-old women had no children. And by 2030, we project that that number is going to be 20%. So one in five women are going to not have children, which is a pretty significant part of the population. That's a, that's a big jump. Again, mm -hmm. almost another one of these doubling of the percentages. So the, so the composition of, this, of seniors in California in 2030, very different 
than historically has been the, been the case. Absolutely. We think that along a number of dimensions, our report focuses on the demographics, but in a lot of ways, seniors in 2030, seniors looking forward, are going to look pretty different than they have in the past. Now, I want to ask a little bit. I really wasn't addressed in your report, but it's still a very important issue, I think, though, for seniors, and that is fewer workers getting traditional pension plans, mm -hmm. um, more and more getting this 401k option. And the problem is that even those that get the 401k option, a lot of times they don't really use it, mm -hmm. um, and they're not they're putting away too much too little money. What are, what are your thoughts on the economic situation of California seniors going forward? Um, so I think one important point is that I income and wealth are harder to predict than demographics. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that depends on how the overall economy does, how the housing market does, how financial markets do. Mm -hmm. So I'm a little less able to make kind of hard predictions about that. I do think that your point is absolutely taken. People with defined benefit pensions had more predictable income streams. Which is the traditional pension. Yes. Um, versus a shift to 401ks. Um, and you do see lower take up of um, 401ks and you right. saw of divine benefit um, type plans. So I think that there is reason to worry, it, there, there always has been, but maybe more going forward that people are not saving enough, that they um, are not going to have enough resources to support them in the way that they are hoping to continue living mm -hmm. um, as they age. Okay, well thank you for that description of the key demographic trends in California's emerging senior population. So what are the implications of those trends? That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Our guest is Laurel Beck, a co-author of a PPIC report entitled Planning for California's Growing Senior Population. So you state in your report that California's senior population is going to grow substantially in the next 10 to 15 years, but what are the implications of that? Um, I think that the growing senior population has implications for a lot of policy areas. But basically, any policy that affects people is going to be affected by a growing senior population. Um, in this particular report, we focus on what that growth means for the demand for support in daily activities and what the state will need to do to anticipate um, the need for facilities and health workers. Yeah. Um, but it really just think of a policy area and more seniors. Is yeah, and you're thinking, I'm going to talk more about this later, but I'm sure in terms of uh, living in place um, and, and all the, the health workers that are going to be required to make that happen, mm -hmm. because as you get older, you're going to need some assistance, particularly if you're, if you're not uh, married and, and or don't have children. Absolutely. So what about the ethnic makeup of California seniors? You said that was going to change rather dramatically. Yes. What are the implications of that? We find that according, according to the data, people from different racial ethnic groups tend to demand different services. And that we want to be a little careful saying that because they may have differential access to services as uh, could well. Could you give an example of that? Just, we may see that, um, for instance, African Americans use nursing homes at a higher rate than other subpopulations tend to, whereas Latinos tend to use nursing homes at a lower rate. And Any explanation as to why that is? There's a lot of things that may be um, there's a lot of different theories. One of them is that maybe um, African Americans, for whatever reason, have less access to home and community-based services. You can also, some people point to cultural differences, which is a Latinos very have broad, extended families, perhaps. Yes, and, and maybe more of a um, more of a desire to try and remain in home as opposed to going into nursing homes. So it could be preferences among consumers. It could that's be really, yeah, traditions among families. It could be information differences across urban versus rural communities, so that right. I think it's a pretty complicated issue, but um, we do see in the data different rates of staying at home versus using nursing homes across different racial and ethnic groups. Yeah. You also see different marital rates across racial and ethnic groups. Sure. So. Well, let's talk about the, the male-female makeup of, of California seniors. I mean, you indicated in an earlier segment that actually the male the portion of, of seniors that are male is actually going to go up a little bit. Any implications of that? Um, I think that th there may be some. I don't think it's going to be nearly as much of a driver of changes as we would think from the racial and ethnic differences. Uh, in our data, we do find that men are slightly more likely to require some assistance with daily activities um, than women are. You're saying are. men are needy? <laughs> <laughs> but I think compared to the racial ethnic trends, this is a, r a relatively small um, small difference. Yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, the consequences of this changing family structures. Uh, I think that's going to be probably a pretty big issue. Um, as, that ch as the senior population have different family structures than they have traditionally in the past, what are the implications? Um, I agree with you that this is a really big issue. As we age, we are more likely to need help with daily activities, and this can be health care, but it can also be personal care or errands, going to the store, it can be chores like cooking and cleaning. And we know that family members are major providers of those types of services. Right. Um, so as we project that there are going to be more seniors that are unmarried or have never had children, then there, um, one, 
less likely to have family to provide that type of support. But we also in our data find that for a lot of reasons, people who say I've never been married are also a little more likely to require some support. So we think this is a population that the state needs to be particularly sort of aware of and focusing on because they're more likely to need external support and it's more likely that they're going to come in contact with state programs. Yeah. Um, what about uh, the potentially worsening economic situation for California's growing senior population? We were talking earlier about the traditional pension plan that people could rely on. Those have gone the way of the dodo bird. I mean, mm -hmm. very rare, uh, except maybe in the public sector. Uh, now more the Spore 1K situation. What are the consequences? Uh, the biggest consequence that we highlight in this particular report is that the role of state programs is going to become increasingly important. Uh, disabled and low-income seniors will qualify for Medi-Cal and other programs like in-home supportive services. Um, but we're going to see a lot more seniors, and if an increasing number of them are qualifying as low income, then a lot more people will be qualifying for these programs. Um, and this is part of the reason that we emphasize that policymakers need to be following trends now and paying attention now, even though the bulk of the growth in the over 65 population is yet to come, because the more we plan and understand, the um, more efficiently we can use our resources. You almost see that tidal wave kind of coming toward us and, and all the implications of that. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much for, for talking about the, <laughs> those implications of this growing uh, senior population. Up next, what are the implications of the aging population on caring for mom and dad? That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. California's growing senior population is going to be more ethnically and racially diverse than past generations and more likely to live alone. What kinds of support services are going to be needed? We're talking to Laurel Beck with the Nonpartisan Public Policy Institute of California, who recently co-authored a report entitled Planning for California's Growing Senior Population. So uh, the number of seniors uh, facing difficulty caring for themselves, how much of, is that going to increase? Uh, in our report, we look specifically at that question, and we project an 89% increase in the number of people who report needing some kind of support, uh, and that's going up to just over a million people in the state. And you think about that, 89%, our population is gonna, isn't going to increase 89% no. you know, in the next 15 years, yet this need is going to increase, so it's dramatically more than the increase in the population, so it it's, puts it in context. Um, what about um, estimating the number of people who are going to have difficulty caring for themselves? How did you come up with those estimates? So what we did is we started, the Department of Finance puts together wonderful projections. Looking and this at is the State Department of Finance? The California Department of Finance. Okay. And they put together wonderful projections on the age, racial, ethnic, and gender makeup of the population looking forward into mm -hmm. the future. So we combine those populations with survey data, and we look at the effect of age and gender, but also your educational attainment, your marital status, whether or not you were born in the United States, and use those different factors to sort of predict the likelihood that you're going to require some care. Mm -hmm. So that one million people requiring, requiring care takes into account trends in racial ethnic um, makeup of the population and as well as the like the household composition of the population. So we try really hard to take into account how different the seniors are going to look in the future. It's 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 a guess but it's an educated guess. It's a very educated guess. So, <laughs> yeah. I don't want to say the guess because I know you look at a lot of variables and you make sure it's statistically relevant and all that but uh, it, it, you know, you're projecting. We yeah. are yeah absolutely there are things that could change things significantly. Okay so um, I'm assuming that, that many if not most seniors uh, are going to have, even those having some difficulty living on their own, still want to stay in their homes. Is that true? I think it is true. I think that um, the question is what home means. I think that okay. in, a, a more, I think, consistent statement is people want to have as much autonomy as they can and as many choices as they can, conditional on their health needs. For as long the, as they can. For as long as they can, right. exactly. But I think that um, one thing you worry a lot about with the senior population is isolation, is getting removed from the community. Right. And a lot of people want to be engaged. They want to be either living with other seniors or living in a more, um, in an environment where they're within walking distance of libraries or stores or other parts of the community. You know, one of the things I find that's interesting when you talk to some seniors is sometimes, you know, they understand that. And, and the senior living is pretty independent. But they, you hear this a lot. Oh, I don't want to be around old people. But, you know, you're older. And, and I think the mix, sometimes I think we, we kind of make the mistake of segregating old people, you know, in, into just with other old people. But mm -hmm. really, maybe a mix with younger and old would be maybe a more vibrant community for some of, some of these folks. Absolutely. Uh, and the kind of services we're talking about here are going to be, you know, if they're in home health care services, that's going to be required if they're living at home, correct? Um, I think when in, in this particular report, we look at a survey question that says, do you require some support 
with some activity of daily living, which mm -hmm. is a, a pretty low bar, and we don't really get into more serious levels of needs. It's just sort of a yes or no. And so in that respect, that one million number is picking up a pretty broad range of needs. It can be people with very high level health needs, and it can be people who need help with more basic things like personal care, bathing, and dressing. Well, let's, let's talk about that, because there is a range of, mm -hmm. of needs and, and services that go to, with, to those needs. One is assisted living. What kind of services do assisted living places provide? Uh, assisted living, you can think of it broadly as sort of a stepping stone between totally independent living in your home and the high-level health supports provided in nursing home care. So most assisted living facilities provide help with things like preparing meals, housekeeping, managing your medications. Um, they, it's a, a community where you just don't have to do all of the things that come with home ownership or independent living. Meals are provided, exactly. that kind of thing. But they don't re provide, as a rule, um, the kind of really high-level health care, 24-hour service that most nursing homes provide. There are some facilities that kind of cater to that spectrum and that provide both assisted living and nursing homes, but in general, when you think of assisted living, it's sort of a middle ground. Okay, so so you've kind of answered the next question I was going to have, what do nursing homes do? So there's a difference between assisted living and nursing homes, Absolutely. but let's talk about uh, the numbers for nursing homes, the, the end of the continuum in terms of the need a lot of assistance. Are those numbers going up, down? Staying the same, what? So um, in general, since the 1990s, we've actually seen a steady decline in the rate of people using nursing homes and the number of people in nursing A decline? A decline. Um, Does that correspond with more people wanting to stay in there in a home? It's people wanting to stay in home. It's the uh, increasing availability of things like home health aids mm -hmm. or people coming to help you with uh, enabling you to it stay makes, in your home. When you're talking like that, it makes me think of you know grocery stores that, that will bring now the groceries to your home. Absolutely. And that didn't exist 10, 15 Absolutely, years ago. Absolutely, exactly. Um, and another thing is I think that the, um, <coughs> the medical community um, also appreciates that outcomes can be better at home, so that there's a little more collaboration between medical providers and patients in trying to make that a reality. We've only got about 30 seconds left in the segment. I want to ask you about the costs of nursing care versus in-home or, or assisted living. What are the cost differences? Um, it ranges tremendously. It depends a lot on what your needs are, where you live, what type of, um, I'll emphasize again, what your needs are. Do you need mm -hmm. health supports or basically personal care supports? We cite one statistic in the paper, which is based off of the AARP's web website that estimates cost, um, costs, and they have an estimate, if you live in LA County, that it would cost a little over $70,000 for a semi-private room in a nursing home, okay. and more like $42,000 for a so home health about, worker to come 40 hours a week. But there's a lot of ifs. And right, right. But it, it basically, it's, it's much less expensive to be in assisted living versus nursing, yes. a nursing home. Yes. Okay. Um, well, that's obviously a growing need for, for senior services. Up next. What should California policymakers be doing in anticipation of this senior boom? That conversation in a moment. This is the Matty Report. Our guest is Laurel Beck with the Nonpartisan Public Policy Institute of California, who co-authored a report on California's growing senior population. So the question here is, what should the state government do in anticipation of this future wave of seniors? Um, so, should California policymakers anticipate a demand for uh, increased spending on programs like Medi-Cal or in-home supportive services? Absolutely. Um, most seniors have the majority of their health care provided through Medicare, the federal program, but low-income and disabled seniors qualify for Medi-Cal, which both provides health services and pays for nursing home care and has other programs associated with it, like in-home supported supportive services, IHSS, mm -hmm. which pays for people to bring support workers into their home to provide with personal care. They don't provide health services, but they do help people stay in their home. And sometimes them. those are, could be family members. Yes. As well. And there's also discussion, a little bit off the track here, there's been a discussion in the legislature about whether those in-home supportive services employees should be allowed to unionize. And so that becomes a whole other issue because chances are if they unionize, they're going to have better pay and benefits. Um, that will lead to a cost somewhere that someone's going to have to pay. So it's just, it's, there's a lot of things going on here that have policy implications. You know, you state in your report that it's helpful to think of two broad categories, where seniors live and what type of workers they're going to need for help. So let's start with where seniors live. Uh, you anticipate that most seniors are going to prefer to remain in their homes. We've talked about that. So how or who should pay for those services? If they want to stay in their home, and need in-home supportive services, who's going to pay for that? Uh, for the most part, people are going to be responsible for paying for them on their own. If you aren't low income and don't qualify for Medi-Cal or some other government programs, this is something that you need to anticipate in case anything happens and you require some support. For people who do have low enough income to qualify for Medi-Cal, they can qualify for IHSS and there are some other programs which will allow the state to subsidize bringing workers into your home. 
But I think another thing to keep in mind is that the vast majority of these services are provided in an unpaid way by family members. It's children supporting their parents and right. spouses supporting each other. Um, it's a really big burden on family members of people who require some support. Um, and so it's not a direct financial issue, but is more about time and resources. Right, yeah, yeah. the caregiver is also a person that's in the equation. I think people, when they're doing their financial budgets for retirement, they need to probably be thinking about, they may need some support when, as they get older, and mm -hmm. maybe not thinking about that. So what about assisted living? Who pays for that? Um, for the most part, that's another thing where people are on their own. There are some very limited cases where, um, where Medi-Cal will cover assisted living. There's a program called the Assisted Living Waiver, which subsidizes assisted living care for a pretty specific subset of Medi-Cal beneficiaries in a certain subset of counties. But for it's the like 15 counties, like I read in your report, a very small group. Very small group. And so for the most part, um, Medi-Cal will cover you if you need nursing home care, if your needs are intense enough that you require that level of assistance, but for assisted living, it's And just to put it in context, and I, if I'm wrong, I'm sure someone will correct me, but I think it's 58 counties in, in California, yeah. so 15 out of 58 counties, a, a small subgroup. What about nursing home care? Who pays for that? Um, it depends a little on what your needs are. If you need long-term nursing home care, sort of indefinitely, and you're low income and have, you meet a number of other financial requirements, then Medi-Cal will cover it. If you're in a nursing home to recover from a medical event or a surgery, then Medicare will usually cover that if you are a Medicare beneficiary. So Medi-Cal is a, is a big player in the nursing home Absolutely. situation. Yes. Um, can you briefly describe how Medi-Cal is funded? And also, when you talk about Medi-Cal, a lot of times you hear people talk about managed care. Can mm -hmm. you kind of talk about those two issues for a moment? Uh, so first, Medi-Cal is uh, funded jointly between the federal government and the state government. In California, as a rule, it's a 50-50 split on Medi-Cal expenses between the state and the feds. Um, managed care is an effort that's going on across a lot of states, including California, to try and make care for people who have um, intense health needs more efficient, to coordinate across different providers, if it's different, um, if it's your nursing home director, your in-home workers, your doctors, the so different, with, So ahead. what they do, I think, in Medicare, if I understand you, correct me if I'm wrong, is with Medi with, um, with managed care, excuse me, with managed care, what they do is they say, you know, pay this amount per month and we'll take care of all the services, as opposed to a fee for service yes. plus, we're gonna pay for each one. So the assumption is in the former, in under managed care, that the company, who's ever providing it, has an incentive to keep you healthy so they don't have to provide the care, and so it's more preventative as opposed to you know, after the fact with a you know, fee-for-service. Yes, and to I hope I made that clear. I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a complicated thing. It, mm -hmm. It's also to help reduce duplication of services across different providers and to make sure that everybody involved in a certain patient's health is on the same page about what they're receiving, what they need, and, um, and trying to save money in doing it. Let me ask you this. Um, workforce development. I mean, the, the, obviously, the, the, you talk about health care workers. That's going to be the demand's going to be changing, who we need there, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So we're, when we talk about an increasing number of seniors and an increasing number of people needing support, that's a demand for services. So we're going to need a commensurate increase in the supply of services as well. Um, we're going to need people with pretty specific skill sets. Um, a lot of them are going to be allied health workers who are, when you think of health workers, you think of doctors and nurses. But, but this, actually, that's not what you're talking about here. Here we're talking about home health workers, nursing aides, medical assistants, people who can be trained at a community college. Right. Um, and so it's going to be important that the state think about the capacity of community colleges to, um, to train them. Well, I want to thank Laurel Beck with the Nonpartisan Public Policy Institute for joining us. If you want to keep up with state and local politics, you can follow the Maddie Institute on Facebook, Twitter, or log on to our website at maddieinstitute.org. This is Mark Kepler for the Maddie Report. Thanks for joining us. The views expressed in the Maddie Report are those of the individuals participating in the program and do not necessarily reflect those of the California Channel or the Maddie Institute. If you'd like to share your thoughts about the points and opinions expressed on the Matty Report, visit our website at mattyinstitute.org.